you keep saying money's not important, sure, why would it stay in your life? It's not important to you, so it's not going to stick around. Episode 110. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we're continuing the conversation about money. And I'm joined on the show by the brilliant Aja George, who I met, actually I didn't meet him, I met his partner um, in Nashville, Tennessee, when I was there a few years ago on a digital marketing conference. And she introduced me to Aja, and Aja is a really inspiring guy um, he originally was a popper in LA and he danced with the likes of Kiki Palmer Miley Cyrus Chris Brown and Justin Bieber so a really accomplished dancer in his own right and he realized that he wasn't fulfilling his purpose in this career and he took a very distinct u-turn if you like out of the creative world and into business where he explored the worlds of wealth management, entrepreneurship, sales, to now where he's actually a financial consultant who helps clients find financial security, helps them develop prosperity mindset needed to be able to sustain and, uh, and grow wealth. He helps them with financial literacy and generational wealth opportunities. And in this episode, uh, Aja discusses his own story and some of the skills that are involved in developing prosperity consciousness and how wealth can be accumulated and made. Many of these things we never get taught at school um, and it's in, in, in Aja has a, an incredible enthusiasm and, and passion for, for this and for, for business. So sit back, relax and enjoy Aja George. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Hey Jack. All right. Yes, sir. Pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome to the Business of Architecture Thank UK. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. It really excited to have this conversation. We're going to touch on a number of topics from, uh, from your own career. Originally, you were uh, a dancer and you've, you've danced yeah. with the likes of Miley Cyrus and Chris Brown. Yeah. Um, you've had a pretty prestigious career in that aspect. And then you transitioned from yeah. there into sales and, and working with financial products. Um, yes. And now you're uh, a mentor, an educator, an entrepreneur around mm -hmm. prosperity, uh, financial wealth mindset. Um, and I think yep. it's really an important conversation to have for anybody who's running their own business yep. um, and particularly creatives um, Absolutely. about some of the sort of blocks that they experience to creating wealth or the, the money scripts that are kind of latent hidden behind the show, uh, yeah. you know, that are kind of guiding, guiding the actions of an individual. So, mm -hmm. so how did you get started? Just a little bit about your career as a dancer and how you found yourself working uh, in sales and, and becoming like a, a financial mentor? Sure. So it was actually, um, you know, my life is just so interesting. It's gone from one step to another with no real expectations. It's been quite a ride. But um, at the age of 18, I actually, well, at the age of 16, I started dancing and I graduated from high school. 
And um, I decided, you know, I was doing pretty well in dance. So at the age of 18, um, I start going to college and I realized it's really not for me. And so what I did was um, I started dancing almost full time and then I had a little side job. And my mother, my mother's Japanese and in Japan, you're officially an adult when you hit 20, right? In America, it's 21, but in Japan, it's 20. So the day before my 20th birthday, or actually a couple of weeks before my 20th birthday, my mother says, hey, when you turn 20, you've got two options. You can either get a full-time job or you can be a full-time student. But if you're not one of those two, then I'm not going to continue to support you. And um, I was dancing. I was making a little bit of money. And I was like, man, this is going to be my full-time career. So the day before I turned 20, I actually packed up what little I had and um, I left. And that was kind of the beginnings of my entire journey as a, as a professional dancer. And um, it was tough. You know, it was a lot of fun, but it was tough. I was 20 years old. And so, you know, I spent time living out of my car and I spent time couch surfing and, you know, um, and just kind of experiencing that life as a creative, as an artist and uh, living that struggling artist life or that aspiring artist life. And, um, but I, for whatever reason, you know, God just always blessed me in the position to meet a lot of people and, and network with a lot of people. And mm-hmm. so one of my first jobs I did with, uh, was with a girl named Kiki Palmer. She was the star of Aquila and the Bee. And back then she was on a Disney show and movie called Jump In and uh, with Corbin Blue. And she did a little tour and I got booked on that tour. So I did that little tour and that introduced me to some people. And then long story short, I got introduced to the choreographer for Miley Cyrus at the time. And then I did a job with Miley Cyrus. And that job led to me meeting the, the director of Step Up 2. And then he introduced me to a bunch of people and, and, and allowed me to do um, a webisode series called BLXD, Legion of Extraordinary Dancers, which was incredible because it was an opportunity for dancers to really be our own uh, personalities and characters without having an artist to dance behind. So that was an incredible experience. And then shortly after that, he, um, he said, hey, I'm doing step up three. I'd love you to be a part of that. So then I got a chance to do that. Meanwhile, I'm doing little jobs and, and like I'm showing and teaching Chris Brown and Omarion here and there because uh, we all lived in the very small neighborhood like North Hollywood everybody lived there and then from there I ended up um, John Chu the director um, while I was on another tour ran into him in Atlanta Georgia and I was like what are you doing here and he goes I'm actually about to shoot a movie for Justin Bieber and we're looking to add additional dances would you be open to doing that and I said shoot of course so then I ended up doing the Justin Bieber movie And then they liked me so much, management liked me so much, that they said, hey, would you mind going on tour with us? So then I ended up doing his European leg. And um, it was just, it just kept going. And, you know, I always tell people, business like that, you got to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. See, people always say you got to be in the right place at the right time. But if you don't know anybody, (laughs) a lot of the times you're not going to get a lot of places. And so luckily for me, for whatever reason, God blessed me with the ability to be likable which I think is a learnable skill, but um, I never learned it. It was just a part of who I was, and I'm so grateful for that. And people just always liked me. I would hang out with people. Literally, me and Chris Brown would be in the, uh, in the studio till the wee hours of the morning, and I'm thinking in my head, why does he want me here? Like, I'm not, you know, I don't bring a lot of uh, financial value or social value or whatever. Like, why does he want me here? But he just enjoyed being around me. And once I came to grips with that, my life, like the way that I looked at everything kind of changed because I realized, you know what? I'm worthy. Like Mm. just because he's Chris Brown, just because he's Justin Bieber, just because this is Miley Cyrus, right? I had my 21st birthday at Miley Cyrus's house, right? And I was like, why would she let me have my birthday party at her house? You know, I always thought about these things. And then I realized, you know what? Like they're just people too. And they just want to hang out with real and cool people too. One thing I never did was I never sugarcoated anything. I never lied to them about anything. I never told them something just because I thought they wanted to hear it. I was never yes men to them. I always told them how it was straight up. And I think they respected that a lot, especially Justin Bieber, because we started off kind of rocky. And then I told them straight up, I was like, hey, I don't care who you are. Um, Like, I understand you're like the hottest pop sensation right now, but I'm a human being too, and you're not going to disrespect me. And I think he really took that and, and, and then we think it, we became really, really close. And um, so what happened was I was in the industry till about 2014 or, or 15 or so. And I just, I couldn't imagine myself continuing in that industry too much longer. 
I just felt like I was plateauing and I just wanted a basic life. I wanted to own a home, you know, have a family, you know, get married, have the American dream life. And there weren't a lot of people in the dance industry that I felt like had that kind of a life. Yeah. Um, they were always going out, spending money on cars and, you know, clothes and going out to the bars and all of that stuff. And none of them were really married or had children. And they were all just kind of living for the weekend and not really planning for the future. And I thought, if I continue to be around this circle, what's the likelihood that I'll end up in the same position there? And so I actually did what all I, I know I could do is I, I applied for a job. Uh, and the only place that would take me was retail sales because, you know, you didn't need a degree really to do that. And so I ended up get, going into sales at Best Buy, realized how much I really enjoyed sales. Best Buy is an electronics store out here in, in America. And I, I realized how much I love, number one, the products, and number two, connecting with people. That was a big deal for me. I would always talk. I mean, I had repeat customers that would only talk to and come back to me. Mm. Um, no matter what it was, like they needed a little flash drive. They'd be like, I'm only buying it from Asia. And I'm like, you know, I don't make commissions here, right? <laughs> I'm making $12 an hour. Um, but that was a, that was a big realization for me. I love the products. I love the people. Then I wanted to get paid more. What, what, was there, um, an amount of humility in that transition from kind of, you know, touring? Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. People thought I was crazy. So I actually posted, that's a really good question. I made a post on Facebook. And I said, thank you guys for the experiences, this, uh, everything that you showed me, everything that you've taught me, all the friendships, everything. It's been incredible, but I'm retiring from the dance industry. And literally there were hundreds of responses saying, you're crazy. You're so talented. What a waste of talent. Don't do that. Why stick around? We want you here. Like so many responses. And there were a couple sprinkled in like, what are you going to do next? Like, I'm excited to see what you're going to do next. And, um, I had no idea what I was going to do next when I put, when I put that post up. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, here's the other thing too. I, I'll admit this. I did step up three. I had, um, I actually had lines in the movie from beginning to end. I was in the main crew. And so any other job after that kind of, kind of felt like, why, like, why would I be in another movie as just a dancer with no lines? You know, like I was already in a dance movie, by the way, step up three was the highest grossing movie out of all of that entire series. And so I'm like, why would I do anything else and just kind of be a background dancer when I had lines and I was an actor, you know, I got to go up from there, but I didn't really care about acting. Yeah. So then I was like, well, I don't want to do this, but I don't want to do that. So <laughs> where do I go next? And um, so, yeah, it was a really, it was a really interesting experience going from it dance to going to $12 an hour at retail. And people recognized me, by the way, they were like, wait, aren't you? <laughs> Weren't you the guy in that movie? <laughs> you were Kim. That's fine. <laughs> so it was, it was interesting. It, it, is, is, is the dance industry uh, similar to sporting industries where your body can only kind of be performing at that high level of intensity for a, a period of your age? Or do, do dancers, you know, um, and you're prone to injury and things like that? Or Yeah, you're definitely prone to injury. I think the... Um, I mean, I'll give it to you raw. This is how I feel about the dance industry. I don't think the hip hop dance world is very difficult at all. I think you could dance until you're like 60 years old in that industry because it's not very physically demanding. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, they're like, how come, how come you were dancing, but you weren't like shredded? Or like, why are there, you know, overweight people in the dance industry? And I'm like, it's because it's not very physically demanding. Right. Now, can you be that way in ballet? <laughs> Absolutely not. Like ballet, you have to, you're going to be shredded. You're going to be super in shape, super toned. But that's what that dance style, deter or, or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like it, it needs that, that you have to be that way in that dance style. Um, but in the hip hop dance industry, it's not really, it's not very difficult. Like, um, you, I mean, you could do it for a really long time. Um, you are prone to injury, right? I do know some people that have ended up with injury. Here's the thing. Here's the thing that's tough about the dance industry. There is no proven system. Like there is no, you do this and then you will get this. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that always kind of bugs me. There is no way. I know some people that are so super talented, but they never got a chance. They were, in my opinion, like way better dancers than me when it came to certain things. And they should have gotten the jobs over me in certain, in certain things. But because there's no real proven system, and like I said, I was just always in the right place at the right time with the right people, 
And so they would pick me. If you're friends with somebody, you're going to pick your friend over somebody who's better just because they're your friend. And so yeah. there's no real system except for, hey, go meet a lot of people and become everybody's friend. Right. And even then, it's not guaranteed because I knew people that were really good friends with certain choreographers that still didn't get jobs. Right. And so that was the one thing like in, in, in sports. It's pretty simple. Well, sports is tough, too, because, like, for example, basketball. Well, here, basketball is really important, is big. I think where you are, soccer is really big, football. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, in basketball, at least, like, you have to be a certain height pretty much, right? And if you don't grow, no matter how good you are, it's really, really difficult for you to make it into the league or professional. And so that's, like, the first thing. Well, what's the likelihood that you're going to end up being six feet something tall, right? And then on top of that, you got to be really good. You probably have to go to a school that's recognized in order to get on like the scouts' radars. And then you have to go through the NBA draft and hope that a scout sees you there. And like there's just, but there's still a system a little bit. Yeah. In the dance industry, like there's nothing. Like it's just like you move across the country and you hope you make it. Like you get a you get an agency, and then the agency all their job is is to send you on a bunch of auditions. Mm -hmm. They're just gonna send you on a bunch of auditions. And there might be a thousand people at one audition and the dance and the choreographer is only looking for two dancers. Wow. Because they know the other eight that they're going to already hire. So they only really need two, but they're going to have an audition with a thousand people there just to get to those two people. You know what I mean? And it's wow. just like, it's just super tough. So uh, that was one thing I didn't like. I always encourage dancers to have something else on the side because tomorrow's not promised. You could get hurt. It's just like, it's just like sports. Um, but also like, there's just no proven, like one day you might be the hottest thing and the next day you're not. And then if you don't have some sort of multiple stream of income, you're kind of out of luck, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And also yeah. You, as you, as you were saying that life, the lifestyle as well, like if you're continually on the roads, <laughs> like yeah. you're going to, there's going to be the excesses and the yeah. um, temptations, and, you know, and all the sorts of things that go with. Exactly. And so to kind of give you, to kind of round back to how I ended up in the financial industry was once I realized that I enjoyed people so much, I wanted to do something that I was providing value for people versus just selling them something. Yeah. And um, when I was at Verizon Wireless, where I transitioned from that side of Verizon, I was making almost six figures a year just selling phones and tablets, which is insane to me that you can make that much money. I think it's a little different now. But back then, you can make really good money selling phones and tablets. And I never really felt great about it. I know the, the customers left happy because they got something better and upgraded and the latest mm. and the greatest or whatever, but I never felt like I was actually adding value to their lives. And so um, when I got referred, I got referred by one of my best friends and a coworker actually at Verizon. And he said, hey, there's, a, there's this financial firm around the corner, literally around the corner from our Verizon store. And they're always looking for, you know, super sharp people, people that are good with other people, people that are business minded. And I don't know if it'd be a good fit for you, but based on what I know about you, I think it might be worth taking a look at. And I was like, I was open-minded because I knew I wasn't going to be at Verizon forever. I knew that for sure. Yeah. And so he, he actually, um, he sends me there. I meet with one of the brokers there and um, I loved it because it was financial education. It was important rules of money that people didn't know. Things that I didn't know. By the time I was 20, um, wait, 20, 23, 24, I was making six figures in the dance industry. Never saved anything, didn't have any retirement accounts, never built an emergency fund. I was making six figures living paycheck to paycheck. And that's a problem in the dance industry because you really never know when your next paycheck is because you're an independent contractor. And yeah. so that was always kind of a, an issue. So when I saw that financial education and information, I was like, shoot, everybody that I know needs to know this, right? One of the things they said was we, we aim at teaching the middle class what the wealthy people do with their money. And I was like, shoot, if I knew that, I'd probably be a lot better off. And then he showed me how well the financial in industry does as far as income, how much you can make. And I was like, oh, I'm for sure building a business in this industry because I know that there's a huge need for it where I come from in Hollywood and entire, in the entire nation. And so that's kind of how I transitioned then. And it wasn't an easy transition, but it was 100% worth it. Mm. And so, and, and so what is it, what is it that you do now in, in terms of in sales and financial education? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the short story is we teach the middle class what the wealthy people do. So what we do is we sit down with families and we take a look at their entire financial strategy that they have now. And then we look, we take a look at where they want to go. And then we help build a roadmap to get there. Right? Most people, most people don't have any financial plan. They have no idea what they want to do, uh, and how to get there. 
And I always say this, I, like, because I, I hear people all the time, they say, well, I don't have enough money. That's why I don't have a financial professional. And I say, okay, well, let me ask you a question. If you were to get into physical shape, right? You were to get a fi financial shape, you want to get a six pack or get some muscles or whatever, would you wait until you got there first and then get your gym membership? Or would you get your gym membership so that you can achieve those goals? Right. And so the problem with middle America is we're not because we're not educated because I come from middle America, like lower middle class. And the problem with people here is that we think that financial education is only for the wealthy people. And yeah. I think the government and the corporations kind of did that, too, because there's companies like Morgan Stanley and Charles Schwab and JP Morgan and all these big companies. But they won't even talk to you unless your net worth is at about a quarter million dollars. That's only like five to 10 percent of the population. That's not a lot of people. And then they do commercials like that and everything. And then middle class is thinking, okay, well, they're not going to help me. So why even bother? Yeah. But there are companies out there and there are independent contractors and agents out there that will, that will help people like that. And, um, and then you just have to get over the skepticism. And then you also have to get over the mindset. Because a lot of people, they're not poor. They just have a broke mindset, right? And so we have to help them get out of that. And so it's just a lot of... Um, I, I love what we do, but as far as like the products we do, we, we focus mainly on insurance, retirement, and investments. Um, we don't do day trading or anything like that, but our goal is to help families retire with dignity, make sure their families are protected, have mm -hmm. an emergency fund in case that, you know, something happens to them and they're not able to generate income, make sure that their families are taken care of, they can still pay the bills, right? Some people need to go really deep and we need to go budget every single penny. Right. But all of that stuff is so important because here in America, money is such a taboo subject. People don't talk about it. And I'm convinced that's why people have so many money problems is because people don't talk about it. Right? They say like sex is the same way. They say like, you know, there are just certain things that people are struggling with mm. um, mentally. I think mental, uh, mental wellness and mental health also was very taboo to talk about and recently has been a growing subject. And I think because of that, there's going to be a lot of people that thought they were depressed or thought they had anxiety and thought they had ADHD and thought they had all these things. And they're going to realize, oh, shoot, I didn't really have that. That's just, that's just what society made me think that I had because it was just easier. It was just mm -hmm. easier to diagnose that. But if we start talking about it, then we can make a huge change. When you said um, a, a broke mindset, what, yeah. what, what did you mean by that? Well, um, so I tell people this all the time. I think, I think your mentality and your mindset uh, for a lot of people is a form of slavery. Um, and I know that's controversial to say, you know, I'm, obviously I'm half African-American, I'm half black. And so my ancestors somewhere down the line, they were, you know, in that position. Um, but when I look at that society today, there's a lot of people that think that they're not worth a lot of money. They mm -hmm. think they're not a, worth a lot as far as their life values are concerned. And, um, you know, if you believe in God or you believe in energy or whatever you believe in, like you were meant to do something a lot bigger on this earth. I always tell people, I don't know about you, but I wasn't put on this earth to simply learn how to struggle, learn how to pay bills and taxes and then struggle to pay bills and taxes and then someday die. Like I was put on this earth to do something great, whether it be helping a lot of people, whether it be continued and contribute or grow or give people recognition and, and important like whatever but you're not you're not meant to just kind of coast through life and the problem is some people they can never get out of that mindset and they need to have a paradigm shift they need to believe that they're able to do something bigger and better and that mm. they were meant to do something bigger and better because everybody's got that seed it wasn't just michael jordan you know what i mean it wasn't just tom brady it wasn't just jay-z it wasn't just these people everybody's got that seed inside of them the question is will you actually and start to germinate that seed will you water it properly will you give it the sunlight will you take care of it so that it grows into something bigger or will you just let it sit in the soil and what are the steps for changing the paradigm how do you how do you recognize that you're even in in a paradigm which is constraining your ability to earn well that's a that's a really good question the easiest answer is look at your environment look at your surroundings because your mm. surroundings and your environment will tell you what you believe about yourself um, they say there's a book by James Allen called As a Man Thinketh, and I can't quote it exactly, but it says something to the extent of if you take a look at your environment, all it is is a looking glass to what you actually think, right? And so um, if you want to know what you believe about money, well, look at your bank account, right? Look at, look at what, how much income you're bringing in. Look at the, where you're living. If you want to know what you believe about relationships, look at your relationships in your life. 
do you have good friends? Do you have not so good friends? Like, do you have um, do you have a good relationship with a significant other, or girlfriend, or a boyfriend, or a husband, or a wife, or do you not have that thing? Or do you always end up in a relationship where they're not good to you, or you know you always argue, or they're abusive, or something like that? Because that's going to be your paradigm about relationships. If you want to know how you feel about, or what you actually think or feel about um, your health, right, and your and your body, then take a look. And it, I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Um, and so that's kind of how you would take a look. The most important part, I think, is you have to become aware. Mm-hmm. Once you're aware, then you can start to make changes. But if you don't know, if you, if you have no idea what you're trying to change, then you can't change it. You know what I mean? You have to have an idea of, um, I, I read this book once. I think it was, um, I think it was uh, by Dean Graziosi, um, where he says, most people know what they don't want in life. But how many people actually know what they do want in life? Right. If you talk, if you talk to somebody and they are like, I'm in Orlando, Florida right now. And they say, Hey, we're going to go take a road trip. Where do you want to go? And they're like, Oh, I don't know. I know where I don't want to go. I don't want to go to Arizona. I don't want to go to Canada. I don't want to go to California. I'm like, okay, great. We can go so many places still. Like, where do you want to go? Yeah. Right? If you're not aware of where you want to go, then how are you ever going to make that switch? So I think that's step number one. You got to figure out first where like, most people will never have that conversation with themselves. They'll never think, man, what do I actually think about wealth? Man, mm-hmm. what do I actually think about my health? Man, what do I actually think about happiness? What do I actually, like most people will never think that. But when you do and you start to take action on that, then you start to become part of the 2% of the world that's going to start to make a difference. What, what are the kind of hidden uh, beliefs that people have around money that can often uh, inhibit them? Yeah, so I think this is a big one, man, because I think most people, um, most people are raised with parents that say things like money doesn't grow on trees, right? That's too expensive. Um, it's not worth it. Um, what do I look rich to you, right? Like all these things. Oh, filthy rich is another one. Here's another thing. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. When somebody pointed this out to me, I thought it was incredible. It's kind of a life changer. Most movies that you watch. The antagonist, the bad guy of the movie, are they poor or are they wealthy? Most of the time. Yeah, they're wealthy. They're wealthy, right? Yeah. So even Hollywood makes you feel like, and here's the thing, you're not even, sometimes we don't even notice it, but we're just watching these movies. They also, for whatever reason, a lot of them are Russian, right? So then what do people think about Russian people that are in America? They're like, oh, their, their accent sounds mean. I'm like, their accent doesn't sound mean. You were just programmed to think that their accent sounds mean because that's all you've seen since you were little. Mm. Right. And so when we're young, we have this time where our minds can be programmed. I really believe this, by the way, I don't have to believe it. It's scientifically proven, but your minds are programmed from the moment you're born till you're about seven or eight years old. Now, here's the beautiful thing. You can always reprogram that. It's difficult if you make it difficult. It's simple if you make it simple, but you can reprogram your mind. And what happens is from zero to about seven or eight, right? We see these things, we watch movies and TV shows and we listen to music and we, we see our parents and that's a big one. We see our parents and how they react to money and that kind of determines who we become over time. And so you hear your parents like you ask for candy and say, no, you don't need that right now. We can't afford it. Or you want a toy and they're like, oh, that's not worth it. Or, hey, what do I like? You know, you ask for something and they're like, what do I look like? Do I look like I'm rich to you? Or, you know, man, you can't, don't ever be filthy rich. Or, man, look at that person, they're filthy rich. Or they see somebody drive by in a Lamborghini and they're like, oh my gosh, I wonder who they scammed to get that far. Like, they just have all these negative connotations of money and then they pass that on to their children. And then the children don't even know what's happening until they're older and they're making thirty or forty thousand dollars a year living paycheck to paycheck they're super dissatisfied and they're wondering why am i in this position how come i can't make more money why am i why is money always leaving me and then on the flip side they're saying the money isn't that important well let me ask you a question if you were in a relationship and you told that that uh, the partner that you're with that they weren't that important would they stick around for too much longer Probably not, right? Probably not. And money is the same way. You keep saying money's not important. Sure, why would it stay in your life? It's not important to you, so it's not going to stick around. But if it's important to you, right, and you know, by the way, I don't believe that money makes people worse. Money just makes you more of who you are. Mm. If you're a bad person and you have more money, then you're going to be even worse. 
But if you're yeah. a good person and you make a lot of money, you're going to be even better. You'll contribute more. You'll give back more. You'll build things for people. You'll help people, right? You'll do other, th- you'll do things that you could never do before because now you have that wealth. So I know that was a long one. No, I, I get really passionate but, but, about well, this, this, this. This is great. And it's, it's so fascinating. And particularly what you were saying about the cultural narrative that we have in popular media and it goes back to shakespeare and beyond you know like the kind of yeah it really does the the antagonist of of a of a narrative being wealthy stingy horrible mean Mm -hmm. so we're kind of we adopt that story and sure there's plenty of if you want to find evidence for that there's going to be plenty of evidence for it but it's but it's it's a very like you know it, it 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 really becomes a kind of negative aspiration then like why would you ever want to be money i don't want i don't want to be deemed right. as, as a nasty selfish horrible person yeah. and, you, and you see this a lot in uh in modern media at the moment a kind of mm-hmm. the demonization of of wealth and yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's lots of structural societal problems and and how our countries need to work together etc cetera, etc cetera. but there yeah. is the, isn't it interesting that news never talks about the wealthy people that are doing such good things for the, for the country or for the world. They always talk about the wealthy people that are not doing good things. Right? That's why I don't trust the news and I don't listen to, I don't listen to the media a lot. It's because they're very picky and choosy. By the way, like since this coronavirus has happened, right, it's what, uh, April, almost May of 2020. Like yeah. for, the, for when people listen to this in the future, it's like 2030 and they're listening to this. Um, <laughs> but it's April of 2020 and coronavirus is running rampant. And, you know, the governments are shutting down and businesses are shutting down and all kinds of stuff is happening. And everything in the news right now is bad. Like everything is negative. Well, what about all the good stuff that's happening? Like, why can't we talk about the good stuff that's happening? Because that's so much more valuable anyway. The problem is, human nature is, we want to see the negative stuff. Mm. I don't know why it's built that way, but people get excited to see the negative stuff. They want to spread the negative stuff. They say good, uh, they say good news travels fast, but bad news travels even faster, right? So I think as, as um, entrepreneurs and people that are doing good things, I think our goal is to spread good news as much as we can, because bad news will always travel fast. But if we could do our best to travel or spread the good news too, Mm. Um, then I think that's, I, I think that's what these communities are all about. It's, yeah. and it is, it's really inspiring actually to hear this. And this is one of my, you know, one of my favorite topics as well is the, is the mindset that goes behind entrepreneurship yeah. and the mindset beyond, uh, that goes behind, um, creating wealth and the psychology of it. And, you know, my own personal journey of realizing all these kind of and a lot of them are kind of inherited they're inherited from you know as you were saying from from society from narratives yeah. from parents from culture yeah. um from and from your industries as well and creative industries yeah. as well have a a very difficult yeah. relationship with money there's the, yeah. the starving yeah. artist is you know that is a it's a romanticized ideal if you like that Mm -hmm. if you're somehow getting paid well for your work or for your art that you're somehow your art is somehow lessened by it right and for for many artists for many architects create people that you know is a is a already will just it will kill off any possibility (laughs) of of being able to make a living yeah Uh, Yeah, it's it's difficult you know as an entrepreneur, by the way, I believe this 100% what I'm about to say, and it's contradictory to itself, but I think everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur, mm. but entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. Does that make sense? I know it's weird. Um, yeah, could you go into I think that? Everybody, yeah, I think, everybody, I think everybody has the opportunity inside of them to be an entrepreneur. We were made to be creators on this earth. Mm. We were all made to create and to contribute and grow. And, um, you know, there's a quote that says, if you're not growing, you're dying. And so if you're at the same job that you've been at for the past 20 or 30 or 40 years and nothing's changing, you've been doing the same thing. I mean, I would, I would, you know, I don't know. I would say that maybe you're, you are not dying, but you know, your, your dreams might be dying, you know, who you could be, could be dying, you know? Mm. And um, so I think everybody's got that entrepreneurship within, within them. The reason why I say entrepreneurship isn't for everybody though, is because not everybody will take the time to become aware of who they could really be. And then if you never do that, then you'll never take the next step, right? Yeah. I think everybody's got inside of them what it takes to be 
uh, an Elon Musk or a Steve Jobs or a Jeff Bezos or a Warren Buffett or a, um, you know, even some of these newer guys like Gary Vee or Ed Milet or Grant Cardone or, you know, all of these people, everybody's got it. Alex Morton. Alex Morton's a favorite of mine, too. He's really good. Um, but I think a lot of these people, we've all got the same stuff. First of all, we've all got the same 24 hours in a day. The difference mm. is how we're utilizing them. Um, some people might be smarter than others. Yeah, I get that. But, at the, but most people can still contribute something. You can still do something uh, and be an entrepreneur. But the question is, will you actually get a chance to unleash that? person and that's why i say it's not for everybody because you know entrepreneurship is difficult too it takes a lot of mental toughness yeah. right and um in your in your space in my space like there are a lot of dancers i know that moved to california uh, from all over the not just the country they all over the world and it was they couldn't they couldn't handle it. it it was just too tough for them and instead of getting tougher they just quit right instead of getting better they just got bitter Right. And then they would leave and they would say, oh, and then they would blame the dance industry. I'm saying, no, don't blame the dance, dance industry. You just didn't get tougher. You just didn't get better. Right. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in your industry, too, where they try and they try and they're like, ah, whatever. This industry is for this and this for that and whatever. And they get bitter about it. Yeah. It's like, no, like, just get better. Right. Just just get better. And one of the reasons why is you've got to mentally, right? you got to mentally grow and get mentally tough and build calluses on your brain, like David Goggins says. I, I don't know if you've read that book, but it's, it's so empowering. Uh, David Goggins can't hurt me. I've, and, I've, um, I've, I've seen a number of interviews with him. I haven't read his book though. Oh my gosh. He is, he is on another level. And um, if you can't tell by now, I read a lot. I believe that a smart man learns from his own mistakes, but a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Yeah. I've got books back here. Steve Jobs, Bruce Lee, or Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, the business books, self-improvement books, those books, finance books. Like I love it. This is a, that's a, just a little bit of my, a little <laughs> bit of my library, but I, I really love it because, and by the way, this is coming from somebody who in high school never finished a book. Mm. In high school, I never read a book. Um, I just, I just didn't love, I, they were boring to me. Um, but now I read, I try to read a book a week because there's so much information and so much knowledge inside of them. And it helps you really grow as a human being, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, you just find the books and, and, and apply them into your life. You can't just read them and do nothing, right? Because knowledge isn't power until it's applied. Yeah. So you got to apply the information. But once you do, man, your, your entire life can be changed. And what, do you, what would you say to people when their circumstances are appearing to them as being the thing that's, in, you know, the thing that's holding them back? So often, uh, you know, if, I, if we've you know, uh, spoken about money scripts before on the show and the m money psychology yeah. and, and some, uh, it can be quite a controversial topic. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and many people are like, well, actually, no, there's, there, there is, there's real structural inequalities, you know, opportunity isn't readily available for everybody. It's easy for you to say this, it's easy for them to, you know, these people who have got success, well, they had a better starting point in life. Um, and you know this is again this is part of it's it's part of a belief as well like mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. if if you believe that you got you've got to have started somewhere in order to be able to go somewhere then that yeah. will be that will be true for you how how do yeah. you how do you dismantle that or and how do you do it sens sensitively and empathetically and is it true so, is the reality uh, if i were to do it sympathetically and empathetically and with passion for somebody, I would say, I say, look, I want you to do research and find people who came from nothing and made it work for themselves. Right? I would give them homework. I would say, hey, do me a favor, because I want to hear about three people that came from nothing and were able to create something from, for themselves. Uh, and I guarantee you can find a lot of people like that. They went through really, really tough times. They weren't completely blessed from the moment they came out of the womb, right? They came in, they, they were broke or in abusive, you know, households or whatever the case is. And now they're very, they're very, very successful. Why is it that they could go through that? But, and you come from a much better place, but you feel like you can't do that. Right. And at the end of the day, the answer is you just haven't built the calluses on your mind enough. Mm. You don't, you have a, you have a glass ceiling built and you don't really realize who you are as a human being just yet. Mm. And to me, 
I don't know about you, but to me, that's really sad because I know I can see in you that you've got so much more to offer than what you're doing right now. But sometimes I think maybe I believe in you a little bit more than you believe in yourself. Mm. And, and that's how I would go about it because the, that's the reality. Now look at these people that there are people in the NBA that were at one point homeless and came from terrible homes. And now they're making millions of dollars a year in the NBA. Right. And you take a look at somebody like Oprah Winfrey, who was told that she would never be a public speaker. Right. Her teacher said that she was dumb. She came from abusive relationships. Her weight's always fluctuating. And yet she's one of the wealthiest women in the entire world. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, you look at somebody like KFC, uh, Colonel Sanders, and he struggled to build a business. He went through so much failure. And in his 60s, he finally sold the recipe and became a multimillionaire. Mm. Right. These people didn't have it easy. But the one thing that they all have was mental toughness, no matter what people. And the, they, the reason they had mental toughness, I believe, is because they had a vision. They knew what they were worth as human beings. And they knew what they wanted to contribute to the world. And because of that, no matter what other people said or did or the circumstances that happened in their lives at that moment, they didn't give up. They just kept going because they knew that they were meant for more. The mm. question is, how do you know that you're meant for more when it doesn't seem like it at the time? I'm down in the dumps. I don't have next month's rent, right? How am I? That's the difficult part. And that's where it comes into identity, right? Research and read if, you, if that's what it takes for you. Some people just innately have that. They just know it, that they're meant to do something bigger, no matter what their current circumstances. Some people, you got to read the Bible or you got to read some science books or you got to read some whatever you got to read to understand that I'm not meant to just be here as another body. I'm meant to be here to create something and contribute and give back and mm -hmm. do something bigger and better. Right? Just because your family has never done anything bigger and better doesn't mean that the chain can't be broken with you. Right? Yeah. You can create an entirely new family, an entirely new meaning for your last name if you apply yourself. And so I, I think having a vision, being mentally tough, no matter what, because here's the reality too. Most people do live from their circumstances, right? They've got $100 in the bank and they think they're broke. Well, let me tell you this. Wealthy people don't ever think that they're broke, no matter how much money they have in the bank. They know that they're wealthy. The, bank, the money just hasn't been deposited into the account yet. That's just how they think. Even if they have 100 bucks, they're like, shoot, I'm a millionaire. The money's just not here yet. What do I have to do to get there? But they already believe it, which is why they get to it. Donald mm -hmm. Trump has gone through bankruptcy how many times? Right? He's been broke how many times? And yet every time he still brings his net worth back up. Right. If you're a business person and your thermometer is set that high, then or your thermostat is set that high, then your life will always catch up to whatever that thermostat is. But if your thermostat is set low, then of course you're going to continue to live the life that you're living now mm. because you you haven't changed your identity. And whatever you got to do to change that identity, you got to start now. And for me, it was reading books. Right. Joe Dispenza is breaking the habit of being yourself. Listening to Mr. Jim Fortson, Bob Proctor, and his paradigm shift. Like there's. So many things out there. Marshall Silver has incredible stuff. Jordan Belfort talks about it, right? There's a, there are so many like pieces of material out there and everything's so easily accessible on YouTube now. You can just go on YouTube and look up, how do I change my identity? How do I, how do I increase my, my net worth? How do I believe in myself more? How to grow self-confidence? And video after video after video after video will mm. pop up and it's all free. But then the, the next question is once you see that video, Will you actually apply it? Will yeah. you do it? Or will you think, oh, this is kind of goofy. I'm not going to write down my goals and read it every day. right? I'm not going to say my affirmations every day. I'm not going to look in the mirror and talk to myself. That's weird. But let me tell you, weird people get rich in tough times. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? If, you're, if you're thinking, oh, that's weird. I'm not going to do it, whatever. That's okay. Continue to live the mediocre life. Right? Mm. But if you want to, if you want to read your affirmations, you want to write down your goals and read your goals every day. If you want to have a plan for yourself and a plan for your life, and you want to build a vision, then those are the people that will actually do something bigger and better. Amazing. Uh, it's again, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Some of the wealthiest people that I've ever spoken to have often, there's one guy, um, a guy called David Pearl, who's a, a property investor here okay. in, the, in the UK. He's probably a net worth of quarter of a billion pounds. He owns large nice. swathes, swathes of, the, of London. Um, That's awesome. And I, I went and saw him give a talk at a property meeting one morning. And mm -hmm. to look at him, you wouldn't realize he was, uh, you know, he doesn't fit your typical 
description of someone of yeah. that kind of net worth. He just looked like a regular bloke. He was pretty scruffily dressed. But he started awesome. off he started off the talk by saying um, about his upbringing in North London, and you know he was brought up mm. in a in a in a Jewish neighbourhood, and he was incredibly poor, like extreme poverty. Wow. Like the family, seven of them were living in a in a bedroom, and his mum was struggling wow. to pay the rent and this kind of stuff. And he used the word. He said, "Looking back on it now, you know, I was a happy child, mm. and that that time when I, mean, I was saw, saw my mother like that, and I saw." Um, what we were going for, he said, he was like that. That experience for me was a privilege, mm. and I was like, "Wow, that's yeah. that that's a, such a fascinating way that he's reframed that as being a privilege." Yeah. And, he, and he was he was like, "It it really showed me the the power of of money and what it was about." And yeah. I became very committed that I didn't want to have this kind of life for me or my family for other people i didn't want other people yeah. to i didn't want other people to experience this as well so for me to be yeah, able to to do something was um you know uh, that was the, the kind of burning the burning passion and then he had this incredible yeah. story of how he was a croupier at casinos and then he started investing in property and nice. how he'd be making deals he, he had you know he had no no money of his own and he was kind of you know getting into the right places and and then save, awesome. saving and saving. Very, very inspiring story. But yeah. like, like you say, it's that, it's that, that reframe. And, and also the, yeah. the, the experience of adversity, how, mm-hmm. um, how actually that is one of the hugest muscles in entrepreneurship. Like most oh, people, absolutely. when we get into business, most of us are, are, are way too soft. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I was that way, by the way. That's why I laughed. I was that way, I, no, like, exactly. Like, same, yeah. same here. Yeah. By the way, I, I wanted to kind of piggyback off of what you just said, because that was a really good point. Um, I heard somebody say one time, nothing is good or bad until you give it that meaning. Mm. And it made me think, when I heard that quote, and I actually like thought about it for a little bit, and some people would just call it being optimistic. Um, I call it being aware and just knowing, knowing what, what life really is. Um, even, even if like little things, you know, you get into a car accident or like not a bad one, right. But it can totally ruin somebody's day and week and month. Um, or if like, if you're stuck in traffic, that's a small one, right. But everybody's had that experience before you're stuck in traffic and you're so frustrated or, or if you're cooking and you burn your food or like, you know, just all, all these little things and nothing is good or bad until you give it that meaning. Mm. The traffic isn't bad until you say, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of being stuck in traffic. So for me, when I look at that, I'm like, oh, this will give me a little bit more time to listen to the podcast that I want to listen to today. Right. And then I also learned my lesson. Well, shoot, if I wanted to get here on time, I probably should have left a little bit earlier. Right. And you take responsibility. Stop blaming other people and take responsibility. If you're late because of traffic, you should have left earlier. You knew there was going to be traffic. You should have left earlier. You know, Um, so there's always a lesson to be learned and everything. But yeah, when I heard that quote and just like him, like he didn't look at his like Mr. David Pearl or whatever you said his name was. He didn't look at his past as something that was negative or bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, he looked at it as it taught me how to become the person that I am today. There's a gentleman, Ed Milet, actually, he says, life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Everything that could be negative, there could also be positive if you look at it that way. And there's always a lesson to be learned. And there's always a way to grow and always a way to get better. And I think that's the difference between entrepreneurs that make it and entrepreneurs that, that end up falling out of the business is you can always look at the negative. But if you look at the negative thing as a positive and you grow from it and you learn from it, I think you'll be so much more successful as an entrepreneur and as a business owner. Um, and I, I mean, that goes with everything. So I just wanted to say that cause I thought that was a really cool story. Yeah, no, be, uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, yeah. and, and so all these, all these kind of money scripts, uh, mm-hmm. the, these kind of hidden belief systems that are kind of pulling the strings, if you like, behind the, yeah. behind the scenes, um, what is prosperity consciousness then? Is that the kind of removal of these scripts or is it the whole, the whole package? 
Um, it's, a, it's the whole package. But I think the most, if I were to explain it in like a sentence, I would say it's the way you feel about money. Mm. It's the way you feel about money on a subconscious level. Because you could always tell somebody, you can say, hey, uh, how do you feel about money? And they're like, well, I feel great about money. Like, okay, well, why are you broke? Right? Like, <laughs> uh, I know that's really harsh, but that's, <laughs> that's the reality, right? Here's, a, here's an exercise I do with some people. I say, I say, say the three words, me and money, me and money. When you say those three words together, how do you feel? And be honest. Like, it doesn't matter to me because you're not me. I know how I feel. But how do you feel? Right? Do you feel good? Do you feel disappointed? Do you feel ashamed? Do you feel negative emotions? Do you feel positive emotions? Right? Do you feel emotions that make you feel not so good? Or do you feel emotions that make you feel good? What do you feel when you say those three words? When you imagine those three words? When you envision those three words? Me and money. How do you feel? And I think if you were to ask most successful and most, you know, most you know, successful business people, wealthy people, entrepreneurs and stuff, when you said me and money, how do you feel? And they'd be like, oh, my gosh, I love money. Right? I mean, that's like one of the first things they say, oh, I feel great. Oh, I love it. Give me more of it. Mm. Right? And then you talk to somebody who's just got a day job and they hate their job and, they, you know, they're not really excited about life. And you say, how do you, me and money, how do you feel? Mm. Just whatever. You know? Or uh, I don't know. Like, I feel ang anxious because I start thinking about bills. You know? Um, and so if I were to, if I were to kind of condense it, I would say, how do you feel about money on a subconscious level? Yeah. Is how I would explain prosperity consciousness. Because here's the other thing, too. I want to bring this up. A lot of people work really, really hard. They work really, really hard. But we all know that hard work does not equate to riches and wealth. We, know, we all know that. And if you didn't know that until now, well, now you know that. Because you can think of somebody right now who works really, really hard, and they're still living paycheck to paycheck. They're not wealthy. They're not financially independent or financially stable. We all know somebody like that. So mm -hmm. that means that work doesn't equate to riches and wealth. So why is that? It's because they don't have their prosperity consciousness in the right place. How they feel about money is still not good, which is why they make the money and the money disappears just as quickly. It's all about the prosperity consciousness. And so if they start to realize, because what they'll start to do, if they work that hard and then they increase their prosperity consciousness, oh my gosh, that's a recipe for huge success. Mm -hmm. Most people have one side of the coin and not the other. Some people even have a high prosperity consciousness, but they don't work hard. Right? And that's like, I heard somebody give the example of uh, like if you're meditating and you're at the top of a mountain, you've got your legs crossed and your arms, you know, on your, on your knees and you're, and you're meditating and you're praying and you're saying, God, please feed me, please feed me, please bring me food. And you're expecting for a bird to just like fly into your mouth, right? That's not how it works. You got to go out there and you got to work. We, and, and, you know, in our company, we say, pray like it's up to God, but work like it's up to you, mm -hmm. right? So we always have this vision. We always know that something bigger and greater is there, but we got to bring ourselves closer to that vision so that it attracts us, itself to us too. It's like a magnet, right? The closer you get to it, then it'll attract itself to you. So that's, that's what I think one, uh, prosperity consciousness kind of in a, in a nutshell. Amazing. It's powerful. It's very powerful stuff. And uh, it, it, it is really about the, the, our entire paradigm of how we're viewing our circumstances. And I love what you're saying about oh, absolutely. just being, you know, just taking like a hundred percent responsibility for mm -hmm. absolutely everything. Like be completely responsible yeah. for your experience of life as it is right now. And, you know, just yeah. ask, and just asking that question, you know, how do you feel about, you know, money, money and I, and I know like, if, like, you know, particularly when I was working in a job and I was unhappy, that would have been a, a frustrating conversation. Mm -hmm. Whereas now the, 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 the answer is like, thank you. It's been a, you know, money's been a great teacher to me. Yeah. Um, there you go. You know, trying to build a business and, you know, you don't take it, you don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there isn't anything that's not, it's not easy. There's nothing easy about yeah. it, but it, it's, nah. it's like, you're your biggest, you are your biggest obstacle. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I always tell people, um, if you're going to, if you're going to start a business, the, the, the um, possibilities are endless, right? It's mm. limitless. The only limits you have in business are the limits that you place on yourself. You will never out earn an income, your self-esteem and your self-confidence and your personal belief. You'll never out earn that. So you have to grow. In order for your business to grow, you've got to grow. There is no other way. There really isn't. And well, there is one other way. 
So one of the ways you have a product or a service that just happens to take off, but your identity doesn't grow fast enough, and then you end up losing that business anyway. All right. That's what happens, by the way, with people in lottery tickets. They win the lottery ticket, their prosperity consciousness isn't high, they lucked up on a lot of money, but then the money disappears. Most people that win the lottery end up worse in a worse financial situation than before they won because they spend it all because they don't understand prosperity consciousness. They don't understand how to have a lot of money. They've never had it before, and mm -hmm. their identity isn't of one who's had it before. So then they want to get rid of it quickly as possible, and that's all happening in their subconscious mind. They don't even realize it, and that's the problem. And that's where awareness comes in. Amazing. Um, to, to kind of wrap up the, the conversation, if we could touch a little bit on, on sales. And yeah. last time we spoke, you know, we shared a kind of common interest and passion for, for, for sales. Um, Absolutely. How does prosperity consciousness impact your ability as a salesperson? And, and why do you love selling? What is selling, yeah, so what, what, what is selling for you? Selling for me is getting anybody to do what you want them to do. Um, <laughs> in, sh in short, um, I think it's showing the value of something and, and its benefits and why it would be beneficial to you and why it would be beneficial to me. So I always give this example. I think it's, I, I, um, I think sales is, I think, okay, so Daniel Pink has a book, Daniel H. Pink has a book called To Sell is Human. Right. Grant Cardone has a book called Sell or Be Sold. Right. Um, and so I read, I read a book called Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harbecker. And in that book, one of, the, one of the wealthy principles is you have to learn how to sell because everything is sales. Everything is, when I was a dancer, the reason why I was on the right place at the right time with the right people was because I was able to sell myself. I didn't even realize what I was doing at the time but I was selling my value to these people. And they were saying, well, you know what? Asia's a cool guy to hang around, right? They were buying Asia, right? By the way, if you're in sales at all and you're selling a product, most of the time they're buying you. They're not mm -hmm. buying the product, right? And so I didn't even realize that when I was in dance because I had never read a sales book. Remember, I didn't read until like five years ago, right? So I had never read a book on sales. I just, for whatever reason, had that natural ability um, to, to get people to like me. And then here's a funny story. I read a book called The Game, The Game by Neil Strauss. Have you heard yeah, of that book? I know yeah. that book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I read, I read that book in my 20s. <laughs> there you go. So that book. I might have said a yeah. few lines from it once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> that book is so good if you look at it from a different perspective. Well, it's good in its own respect. But it was funny because when I read it, I was actually in Israel. Mm. Um, I was in Israel um, on a dance job. This guy hired me. He wanted me to come out to judge and teach a class. And I swear, everywhere we went, we went to the mall, we went to restaurants, we went to the gym, we went everywhere we went, everybody knew him. And I was like, Yoni, why do people know you everywhere we go? And he's like, oh, that's a long story. He was already uh, engaged at the time, so he didn't talk about it a lot. He was like, oh, that's a long story. And I just kept asking. I was like, dude, I, I'm really curious. Why do you know everybody in this in the city? And he was like, if you really want to know, I'll show you some stuff, right? So he goes, uh, on your flight home, he's like, I want you to buy this book. And then on the flight home, I want you to read it. And then I want you to watch these videos. And then I want you to give me your feedback. And the book was The Game by Neil Strauss. And I read it on the flight from Israel to LA. I didn't stop. I, I fell in love with the book. And what I remember about the book was, it wasn't just about getting women to like me. It was about getting people in general to like me. And in order for that to happen, there were some things that needed to be done and needed to be said. And then I thought about it years later. The reason I loved it so much was because it's sales. Mm. You're literally selling yourself. Now, here's the thing. When you, when you say that you're selling yourself, people think that of a negative thing. They're like, oh, but I don't want to sell myself. That sounds terrible. No, but do you want people to like you? Of course you do, right? That's sales. Hey, when your child says, I want to eat this cereal for breakfast, I don't want to eat eggs and, and, you know, whatever for breakfast, I want to eat cereal, they're selling you on why they should eat the cereal instead of the egg, right? It's always, if, uh, if your wife or your spouse says, hey, uh, or you say, where should we go for dinner? Should we go get Chinese food? And they're like, no, you know, I was really thinking Italian food. Boom, the sales process has started, right? <laughs> And so everything is sales. If you can learn to be persuasive and get people to see your side 
from from your side, you know, uh, to see your argument or you see your point from your side, then it's. But here's also the thing: you got to see it from their side too, right? That's probably the most important part: is you got to be able to see it from their point of view, and then help them help them see your point of view and why it makes sense, why the two align. And um, yeah, so I've read I've read a lot of sales. I watch YouTube videos all the time. I think as a dancer being, if you know sales, it's good. As any entrepreneur, any independent contractor, any sole proprietorship, anything, if you want to be wealthy, you got to learn sales and marketing. Mm. Um, and then even if you don't want to necessarily be wealthy, but you just want to be more effective in life in general and just happy, I believe, I truly believe this. If you just want to be happy, then learning sales and understanding that it's not about that grimy, sleazy, slimy car salesman, that's not sales. That's not sell. That's literally like bargaining, right? But if you're able to sell, to sell is figuring out what exactly is it that they want and how can I serve those needs. Sitting in there or stepping into their shoes, looking at life from their point of view and figuring out what they want, right? They, the best salespeople are the ones that are going to be in your life for a very long time. They're not the ones that are going to do one transaction and then leave and you'll never see them again. That's not a good salesperson. A good salesperson is somebody you're going to become a friend of. It's somebody that you're going to refer right? When I was in dance, I got referred jobs all the time, right? When I'm in financial services now, people refer people to me all the time. Hey, you did a great job with me. I want you to do the same thing for them. That's a good salesperson. It would be different if I just sold a financial product to somebody and then left. That's not a good salesperson. Yeah. You're just, you're, you know what I mean? And so I believe that sales is a very, very big part of somebody's life. Um, I, we, you know, I'm raising a five-year-old and I tell her all that. Like, she's like, can I do this? I'm like, well, tell me a reason why you would want that, right? <laughs> give me an example of why this would be more beneficial than that, right? If you can give me an option, close, hey, if I could do that for you, would you let me do whatever? I'm like, practice, practice, practice. You're five years old because you're getting programmed now. By the time you're an adult, man, the world's going to be your oyster. You're going to be able to do whatever you want because you're so persuasive and so influential and people like you genuinely because I'm teaching you communication skills. I'm teaching you networking skills and I'm teaching you closing skills, man. You're, that's a superpower. It's a superpower between that and being able to learn. Those are superpowers. I really believe that. Amazing. I think that's the, yeah. the, the perfect point to, to conclude the conversation. And I just want to say a, mass, a, a massive, massive thank you for your, your contribution and your passion and your energy is absolutely. Absolutely. Insane. Hey, the pleasure is all mine. Um, you know, I think the introduction, the way that we got a chance to meet each other, uh, was really it's a really cool story maybe we'll have to tell that one day um but um it's been a pleasure to to be on here and uh and for you to ask me to be on here and to you know for me to be able to share my story and hopefully you know if only one person hears this today and they decide to make a change um i think my job is um uh, my job was done for this podcast um but um you can always reach out you know we're we're very active on social media uh, if you want to find me, it's just Age of George. It's literally my first and last name. And um, the reason I do that, by the way, is because I want to interact with you and I want to help you. If you have questions, if you want pointers, like anything, uh, if you just want to have a conversation, right, pick my brain, get some recommendation on books, anything. I, I, I love being able to contribute and give back and help people achieve their full, I don't think it's ever possible to reach our full potential, but to tap into more of that unlimited potential that we have, um, then I would absolutely love to be able to do that. So um, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Pleasure. I'm so excited um, for everything that you're doing too. And um, yeah, keep it up. Maybe we'll do a part two someday. I hope so. I hope this is the first, <laughs> first of many conversations. AJ. Yeah, let's do it. Let's and do it. Uh, yeah, hopefully I get to meet you in person in the not too yeah, distant future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you got to you got to come out we're in orlando florida now it's you know um it's it's nice today it's rainy but uh we live down the road from disney world and uh it's just an awesome awesome place and it's very laid back and it's very relaxed and it's open and it's it's awesome so i'm gonna build my business here and then i'll probably travel across the country and start building uh, offices and business everywhere else that's the goal but for now come down to orlando let's hang out love it thank you yeah. so much Absolutely. The pleasure's all mine. Take care. All right. Bye. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you.
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.